Well, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here and with 175 people. I know. Like. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, everybody. Hi, I'm Shannon Nichols. I'm the Director of Philanthropy at Sonoma Land Trust and your host for Language of the Land tonight with our topic of winter abundance, turkey tails to miners lettuce. And we're so excited that Autumn Summers is here. And you're gonna be telling us what we should have in our pantries and wellness kits, right? From the local flora that surrounds us. You got it. Excellent, excellent. Well, before I formally introduce you, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, let everybody know that tonight we're using the Zoom webinar platform. Um, which means that you can see the presenters, but not each other, but we really want this to be interactive. So please throughout the presentation, use that Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Uh, Autumn's gonna talk for about an hour and then we have a, about 20 minutes at the end of the presentation where we will read back the questions and answer just as many as we possibly can. Um, we will also be recording this webinar, which I need to hit the record button myself. <laughs> and uh, so um, if you like what you hear, which I'm sure you will, please uh, look for it on our YouTube channel in a couple of days and share it uh, far and wide with your friends. Um, and if you're new to Sonoma Land Trust and just learning about us, allow me to share just a um, brief um, description of who we are and what we do. We're a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to protect the natural lands of Sonoma County for everybody's benefit. We're delighted that you found us. Please go to our website and learn more about what we do. Um, everything that we are able to do is made possible uh, through the very generous support of individuals, businesses, foundations, and some government grants. And so uh, thank you if you are a donor. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, I think that covers all of our housekeeping. And now on to you, Autumn. So uh, from her first class over 25 years ago, Autumn Summers has been exploring the many facets of herbalism with a focus on plant, seaweed, and mushroom identification and uses and growing Medicinal, medicinal and edible plants. Currently, she is the lead educator at the Herb Farm, spelled P-H-A-R-M, which I love, and a core faculty at the California School of Herbal Medicine, studies rather, sorry. She is passionate about sharing this empowering knowledge with others in an enthusiastic, hands-on way. We're so excited that you're sharing it with us tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Shannon and Ingrid. I know we're not seeing Ingrid, but she's behind the scenes doing important work for us, mm -hmm. checking your questions. I'm going to share my screen um, and get us going. And I'm assuming you can see my screen. Is that right, Shannon? Just want a thumbs up on that. Um, right, we can. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, everyone. Gosh. Uh, it's so exciting to see so many people here. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about winter abundance and all of these plants and fungi that are here and uh, lichen and more. Um, and I just want to say thanks for taking the time out um, of your evening to um, join us. And what you're seeing behind me is uh, the California School of Herbal Studies garden. And the other thing that I've also done that for those of you who uh, are familiar living in Sonoma County, I don't know where folks are from, but um, I used to also work with Land Paths, so a sister organization to Sonoma Land Trust. So the mission is very dear, near and dear to my heart. And um, thank you all for supporting Sonoma Land Trust. And if you haven't before, please um, consider doing that. So uh, it's also a full moon. So uh, I've heard some in some parts of the country, it's called the wolf moon. So here we are. And we've also been blessed with rain. I, I know I've been feeling um, oh, relief that it's been raining. <laughs> uh, and of course we need more, but boy, this is a good start. Good, uh, good sign. So let's hope for more of that. And, um, you know, I also want to acknowledge, so we'll get into the plants, but um, it's just so important to acknowledge that we, 
all live in um, homeland of other peoples, the first peoples. And um, it's always great to look at these maps of um, all the different tribes that um, are present in California and were present and still are here. Um, and of course, our Pomo, I live in Sebastopol, so I'm living in traditional Southern Pomo territory homeland. Um, and of course, even with these um, Northern, Eastern, Central and Southern and Kashaya, um, there's, there's groups within those, but this gives you the general idea and also Northeastern Pomo. And then we also have Lake Miwok, Wapo, Coast Miwok and Patwin and Yuki in, um, in our region. So, um, and these are elders that have taught me, um, Julia Parker, who some of you may know, she's Coast Miwok and Kashaya Pomo. Um, heritage and she's a master basket weaver and I learned um, about baskets, um, some basketry and also um, acorn preparation. First learned that from Julia and making soap root brushes. Um, and Violet Parrish um, Chappelle who first taught me about bay nuts. I was at a talk in, um, in the Presidio and um, she has since passed on and is an ancestor in that way but she was kind enough when she shared her bay nut uh, talked about that in the lecture and I came up very excited and she was very generous with her sharing. So wanted to acknowledge these are just some of my teachers. Um, and of course, many, there's many, many more. Uh, this is a wonderful book. So if you aren't familiar with it, MCAT Anderson is also a, a mentor of mine. Um, and I'm grateful to call her friend. Um, she wrote a wonderful book. Um, she's an ethnobotanist. And um, if you don't know this book, Tending the Wild. So she has studied with Native American um, tribes all over California and actually all over the country and wrote this book about gathering together Native American knowledge. And um, I love this. This is from her preface, just talking about, you know, because we often, of course, the, the mission of Sonoma Land Trust is to preserve the land and we want to do that, but we also are part of it, you know, we're, and I know many of you know it, but it's so important for us to remember that we are nature and how do we interact in a responsible and respectful way um, because we are a part of it. And we're learning more about that with like, oh, uh, control prescribed burns and cultural burning and that there's a way that we can, we can work with fire, but also that we can gain respect by interacting and using plants and tying our well being to its existence. And I love this how she says the elder challenged the notion I'd grown up with, one that I should respect nature by leaving it alone. And by showing me that we learn respect through the demands put on us by the great responsibility of using a plant or animal. And I have to say that's true. And I also do seaweed um, classes. And I know there was a wonderful, Heidi did a great seaweed talk um, last year, um, who's a colleague. And you know, that's all wildcrafted. So you have to be in tune and paying attention. And it really, it has, it has gotten me more connected to our oceans um, and the cycles that are going on. And so it could be something just in your own backyard um, or the bigger picture here. And, and some of these plants, she goes on to say in this, there are plants that aren't as abundant, especially some of the bulb plants and, and such, but others, because we're not harvesting them. I mean, they've actually, there's an adaptation to that tending. And um, so it's an interesting place while we, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we all go out and harvest everything, of course not, but that there is a place and that we can learn a lot about that. So let's look at, well, we will get to the plant. So this is, um, uh, Southern Pomo wheel. This was came from David Perry, who is also a um, teacher of mine who's since passed on. He was an ethnobotanist at Sonoma State where I studied anthropology. And just a simple wheel of looking at um, right now we are in Buckeye, what was traditionally called Buckeye time um, and going into Clover time. So these wheels, the seasons, Pinole or pinoli time in June, July, and August. Those are the seeds like chia seeds. We have a native chia seed and many other seeds. So there's probably a hundred seeds, little seeds that were used throughout California traditionally and still, you know, some of those traditions still exist. And then of course, acorn. So you can think about what's your wheel and what, what as we talk tonight, you know, maybe for, for you, it's, it's um, miner's lettuce, you know, this is really the season. We could certainly add that on. This is just a very simple overview. And then I wanna show you some resources um, that I really like. So California Foraging by Judith Larner Lowry. She um, runs um, Larner Seeds down in um, Bolinas. 
Um, Flavors of Home is a great book that's really focused. So these are books that are really California focused. Um, and when you're looking at wild foods books, you wanna know where they're from, or if you're looking at websites, because of course, a lot of things on the, the Midwest and the East Coast don't apply to us. Um, Pascal Badar has a beautiful, he's the two well-crafted fermentation and the new well-crafted cuisine. He's in Southern California and does some, if you want to be really inspired, um, he goes for it and his Facebook page is very active um, and he does a lot of fermentation and just giving you, I think, um, really ideas because he's very focused on his regional plants. Um, and then a few more edible wild plants by John Callis. This is all greens actually, and he's up in Portland. And then the Forager's Harvest and Nature's Garden, um, those are both from the Midwest, Samuel Thayer, but some of, I would say half the plants in each of these books apply to us here on the West Coast. And of course, we're in an unusual situation compared to the rest of the country. We're Mediterranean climate. So here we are, in winter, but it's really also spring for us because it's the time where the greens come and that's what we're gonna get into now. Um, so we're in this, you know, interesting, um, I love it, you know, it's when things, it's colder, but things are coming alive where much of the world is um, at least, yeah, much of the country is in snow and really hunkered down and we don't, we don't get that. So this, why eat wild greens? Well. This is a great book called Eating on the Wild Side. It's actually not about wild foods per se. It's about how do you pick produce that's higher nutrients. But in it, she compares, um, like this is a great example, dandelions compared to spinach. Like we think spinach is such a great superfood or, you know, densely, you know, nutritionally dense. And it is. So this is measuring antioxidants um, when she looked at the research. But look at dandelions, they're off the chart compared to spinach. And so when we start selecting plants, um, we start losing some of these um, nutrients at times. So it's another reason to eat, eat the greens and you don't have to eat platefuls. It's just like including leaves, you know, bits and pieces into your diet, or you can go for it. Depends on what you're, what you're liking. So general guidelines for harvesting. And most of the things, I've selected things that are abundant, um, that are likely to be in, if you, if you have property or rent property, um, that are likely to be popping up or in your neighbor's yard, um, which maybe you could transplant over if you don't have any in your yard or you can even put in a pot. And just general guidelines for harvesting. Of course, know your plant, be 100% sure. Um, don't harvest where things have been sprayed or dog walking areas, power lines, public city parks, things like that. These are pretty no brainers. Know the life cycle. Is it an annual or a perennial? How's it going to affect the growth? Take only what you need. And of course, be grateful and even ask, you know, some people really get into just like slowing down and asking permission and being grateful and saying thank you for the abundance. Okay, so we're going to look at winter greens because that's really what is up right now. And there's a lot. And a lot of these you'll notice are going to be non-natives because um, they've naturalized here. They're from the Mediterranean region and they really love our Mediterranean climate. Um, so they've come over from, from Europe, many of them, um, and have made their home here. So of course, we're going to start with dandelion. So this is a uh, Taraxacum officinale. And when you see that term officinal or officinale in the um, Latin name, that means it was an official medicine back in the day. And so that gives you um, a little, little note there like, oh, this is so important. It's actually in the Latin name. So dandelions actually, you know, it's interesting. They're starting to flower in my yard a little bit. They're a very early flowering plant for us, you know, if, Somewhere where they have more winter, it would be very early spring, but we're more like this midwinter, maybe into early spring. So how do you tell dandelion? Because there are lookalikes. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's poisonous um, in our area. There's things that are going to taste differently. You might not like the taste. Um, and of course, people like to dig them out. But um, the company I work for, Herb Farm, we... Uh, you know, we grow, they grow it up in Southern Oregon because they make extracts. But one way to tell it is, and I'll, I have some more pictures, is it has a very toothy leaf. So dandelion, uh, dantelion is the French, which means tooth of a lion. And so it's a very sharp 
um, leaf, tooth leaf, and it doesn't have hairs on it or very tiny. You have to get very close. Sometimes it has a little bit of hairs. And there's only one um, flower head per stalk. It doesn't branch. That's really important. So these are hundreds of flowers. We're not going to get into all the botany there, but just to let you know. So we know we can buy dandelion greens in the store. And actually a lot of that is chicory, which is fine. It's, it's a relate, it's a relative, but, um, dandelions are really good for us. They're, um, as an herbalist, we love, I love an herbalist love dandelion because it is, um, so nutrient rich and, but mostly it's really supportive for your liver. It helps um, support liver function and bile flow, but it's gentle enough to be using on a regular basis and nutritive in that way. And then the leaves are one of our best, if not the best herbal diuretic that we have, and they're rich in potassium. So there it's an herb that you can use to help get rid of that excess water, but also not lose potassium, which is certainly an issue when um, where you're using diuretics um, at time. So the whole plant can be used. And of course, people make wine out of dandelion flowers. Um, there's a lot of recipes, but the, the greens can be eaten cooked or raw. And here we are at the time where things are starting to come up. And usually when, just like with lettuces, right, which is related to this actually in the, in the group, in the family, the Asteraceae, but um, we, when you have those young leaves, this is when they're going to be the most tender and the least bitter. And then, of course, as the season goes on, they're going to get more bitter and tough. So it's, it's a great time to be using them. And I will say that um, one of the ways that I like to keep it simple, though you can't get super fancy. But, you know, this is something like how do you incorporate these into your day to day life? So you can pick leaves. And if you're sauteing um vegetables, you can chop them up and just incorporate them or add them to soups um, in that way. Um, if you're doing smoothies, this is what I've done when I've done smoothies um, recently is I like gone out to my garden and clipped some leaves of dandelion and some of the other plants and then put them in my smoothie. And then they're just part of that. It's a really easy way to get more diversity, which we know is better for our diet. Um, so dandelion, and let's look at um, how we can identify it with other compared to other things. Oh, this is this great graphic. I just got it, found it of nutrition. Woo, it's pretty bright. Um, so lots of, um, actually it's pretty, so DV is daily values. You can see it's pretty high in A and C. Um, and there was something else here. I've got to move over. Actually a decent amount of iron and copper. And so you can see, look at how many nutrients are in here. Um, pretty amazing. And also dietary fiber. So there's inulin in the roots. And so, um, and the roots, roots are more bitter usually. And of course the roots can be roasted. Um, you can buy that roots roasted for a coffee substitute. And it's not, you know, if you're really a diehard coffee person, <laughs> It's, you're, you're, you may not be super happy with it, but it's a great way if you're wanting to cut down on your coffee to blend and there's actually, um, you can buy the root. There's also a powder with chicory and dandelion um, roasted root and it gives you that roasted flavor. Um, so you can blend it as well. So there are some things that are lookalikes and we wanna know what those are. And again, you're not gonna kill yourself. I'm not, that's the other thing. I'm choosing plants that um, you all can identify, but a lot of people confuse dandelion with this cat's ears. And you can see how rounded the stem is and it's more hairy. And these will have, and you can see here, they will have flowering stems where it branches. So here's a dandelion, one flower head per stem and then these other ones branch. So those are not dandelions. Now, some people do eat the cat's ears. They're just a little um, fuzzier. Um, and um, like I said, you're not gonna kill yourself or anything like that. And then over here, where there's also another um, one called bristly ox tongue, which looks like it has little warts all over it and it is really tough. So all of these will have, when you break the stem, they'll have that white latex on them. And in fact, that's also a traditional use for dandelion is to use that for warts, um, to put that little um, uh, latex, that white latex like directly on a wart. Um, but if you're looking for dandelion, you wanna go for these very sharp teeth. Um, and then you can dig up the root, it has a root and you can chop those up. You can dry them and use them for tea later on. Um, and it will be bitter, but bitter, when we taste bitter, 
many bitters. It sends a signal into the brain and wakes up digestion. And so it wakes up the enzymes in our stomach, gastric juices, our liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and all of that. So we digest better. Okay. That's dandelion. So you can go and just nibble on a few leaves. Um, you can also gather them and dry them and use them in tea. Um, and then they all are also made into tinctures, alcohol extracts. Um, but we're not going to get into medicine making tonight unless I have questions on that. Plantain. So here's another non-native that's coming up, really vibrant right now. You can usually find it almost all year round, but you know, this is it looks premium right now. So we have two of them. They're called ribwort, is another term. So wort, W-O-R-T is a term you often see for a lot of these weedy plants or medicinals. Um, and we have our English plantain, Plantago lanceolata. And you can see, oh, all of these so far have leaves that are in basil rosettes. So it's like all the leaves coming from a center point um, and usually low to the ground. Um, so we have this narrow leafed um, plantain and then we have the broad leaf plantain, which we, I see more of the narrow leaf here, but I have both in my yard. In fact, I have more broad leaf for some reason. So these can also be eaten. They're a little tougher. Um, so this is one that you would want to chop up more and they, they will have some bitterness to them, but that's good, right? A little bit of bitterness. But one thing is they're also used um, in herbal medicine. This is a great, this is like one of, the, one of the plants to know because there's really nothing else that looks like it with these ribs, these lines here. And on the back of the leaf, it's really a, a very distinctive rib. So these are something that can be used. It's called a spit poultice if you're doing it yourself. Like if you got bit by a um, yellow jacket or a spider bite um, or that type of thing, you can take a leaf that's clean and chew it up yourself and then put it on. And it really helps draw out. And there are people who use them for spider bites where it looks really bad. So it's one of those herbs that's used topically for those inflammations. And it has some antimicrobial properties um, we don't use it here so much in the US, though some herbalists do, but in Europe, it's used a lot more for lung. It's, it's um, got a little bit of a mucilaginous quality and is soothing. So it's used in um, lung syrups and things like that. So you can also incorporate it into that. Um, and it's often the leaves will be dried um, and then infused into oil and made into it'll be part of a salve that you would use for cuts and scrapes and that type of a thing. So plantain is something that's great. Just, you know, if you're going to do two plants, this is one everybody should know because it is, it's so soothing and it's so cooling. And most of these plants that we're talking about are cooling and soothing um, to our, you know, our gut and everything, but also to our skin. This one in particular is that way. The other thing is psyllium is a type of plantain, plantago. It's a, it's an East Indian. So if you use psyllium seeds, you need more fiber. We probably all need more fiber in our diet. So um, the, you can see this is the broad leaf going to flower. It's not a showy flower, but the spikes, when the seeds come on, you can just strip off those seeds and rub them in your hand and winnow them off. And they look identical to psyllium seeds. They're a little smaller, but they, you can use them as a you know, a bulk laxative and just soothing. They have that mucilaginous quality you're gonna get like with chia and that kind of a thing. Um, and then you can incorporate them, you know, you can um, play around if you make your own crackers or wanna do that, it's you can incorporate, start incorporating even um, broadleaf plantain seeds and play around with that. Um, so really a lot of uses for, you know, as a plant that's low to the ground that we can easily walk by. And one of the common names of this is white man's footprint because it really likes disturbed soil, um, grows places where a lot of things won't grow in your garden necessarily. Um, obviously you don't wanna be harvesting it on a driveway where <laughs> there's, there's animals and cars and all of that, that type of a thing. But, um, you know, if you find a plant, let's say you don't have these plants in your garden, they're common and you can transplant them, you know, find a little plantain and bring it over, gather some seeds and spread it out. And, um, and then you'll be blessed with some plantain in your yard. Taking a little sip there. Okay, let's see. So, oh, I did see a recipe, I've got to try it, where somebody, um, takes the leaves and coats them with oil and a little bit of salt and makes um, plantain leaf 
chips like the kale chips and because of the fiber in there they actually hold up a little bit um, so I haven't tried it yet but that's an interesting idea for a recipe and then just like I said for cooking you know it's chopping them up finely or putting a leaf or two in a smoothie that type of a thing Okay, so we can spice things up a little bit with um, the radishes and mustard. I'm focusing on the radish here, but we also have wild mustards. Um, so this is the ancestor to the radish that we eat. The roots here are more tapered and fibrous. They're not that succulent, spicy root, but the leaves are really edible, especially now um, when they're younger. They are a little, a little tougher, but they're... Um, they have that kick, that mustardy little spicy radish kick. And what's interesting is you can see the little leaflets here. Well, it's actually, you know, is this technically a compound leaf or not? It's a little tricky to tell. It looks like a, here the leaves just really deeply divided, but this big lobe at the tip. Um, and it, when you break it, it doesn't have any of that, that latex in it. And then these are, I saw a few starting to bloom, right? The, the, this is in the Brassicaceae family. So these are the ones, you know, we know cabbage and broccoli and all of that loves this cool weather and the same with this. So these are growing and they're gonna like go to flower very soon. Um, and they can range in color from this very creamy color to a, a pale yellow and to this, um, lavender purple and even a kind of rosy hue and then the mustards are more that mustardy yellow all of them are edible um, and spicy and so um, it's something where you can use the leaves and chop them up and add spice again put them in your smoothie the flowers are great to put on salads just to eat on their own um, and they have a little spiciness not not over the top they do a little bit of, um, you can see on the stem, they're a little tough on the stem. So that's another way to tell them. And they have that basil rosette at first of these very lobed leaves. And then they, of course, they send up their flower stalks, which can be, depending on the conditions, two or three feet high. Um, not, yeah, two, yeah, even four feet high. But what's really cool too, so now we've got the greens and then the flowers will come and you wanna leave some of the flowers on. I leave them, they're also, you know, good habitat plant for insects. Um, but if you let these pods come after it flowers, um, when they're green like this, they're a nice crunchy spice um, and you can actually pickle those. So that's a fun way to play around with if you like that, a nice little crunchy spice. And this was a kind of a fancy recipe I found for pickled radish seed pods. This one has a little lemon verbena herb in there. Um, and this is what they look like afterwards. So it's basically using vinegar, which, you know, I would use apple cider vinegar, but this was this particular recipe. And they added a little sugar and salt and water and garlic and, you know, Basically, you go with what you want. You could add peppers to it too. Um, and then you um, put it in the refrigerator after you cover that all up and then put your pods in there and um, put it in the fridge and you've got a nice pickled condiment, a little spicy condiment to add. Um, an easy way if you eat pickles, um, you know, as you take your dill pickles out or your, your bread pickles, um, that juice can be used again and you could you know, save some of that in your fridge and or, you know, your freezer wherever you can. And then when those green pods show up, which, you know, could be sooner than later, you can then cut, you know, put them into that pickling juice and just, uh, and you can add some more herbs if you want, you know, for flavoring. So um, that's a nice way to, to utilize these. And they do, you can also cook with them if you wanted. They just have a beautiful shape and a nice crunch to them with the radishes. Okay, I'm checking our time. I think we're doing well. Um, so let's see. I don't think, I think that's it on the radish, but they are really yummy. And actually, when you go to the coast and see the mustard and radishes, they'll have a nice salty, um, spicy flavor there. These are like really great trail snacks. And that's something I do a lot. I'm a grazer. I'll just be going along and picking things. It's great. It's so empowering. And it's really our human birthright to know these things because, um, if we were in a culture that, you know, we grew up closer to the earth, we would know, you know, all the edible plants or most of them and, and the seasonality of them. So, um, and so we can, we can learn that now. Here's one that you really find in gardens, but once it gets in there, 
Um, and it'll naturalize out, it'll, it'll sneak out. So this is at the California School of Herbal Studies. We have this plant and it's just starting, the leaves are starting to come out and it is an allium. So it's in there with leeks and garlic and onions and all of that. And it does have a little bulb and it's called three cornered leek. And it actually, you can see there's a cross section from the top. It actually is like a little triangle, the stem. So it's very distinctive. And then the leaves, so it looks like you break a leaf and it smells like an onion, it's an, onion, it's an allium. And so it also has this major midrib on it. And then when it blooms, it's really distinctive with these nodding white flowers um, on them. And they're really, um, yeah, they're gonna be starting to come up now. I've seen the leaves coming up at the California School of Herbal Studies and they have a really lovely oniony green onion garlicky flavor like green garlic and they're so prolific um, once they get going and the whole thing can be eaten so the flowers can be put in a salad or you know added to things the leaves can be chopped up and used just like you would scallions or things like that um, the little garlicky there and um, and then they do have little bulbs you could even work with um, and I found this recipe on uh, the wildplantguide.com three-cornered leek pesto. So with a lot of these, you know, pesto is really bringing together a lot of greens. We think of it with basil most of the time, but you can mix a lot of different um, uh, greens in there. And another way in Greece, if any of you have traveled to Greece, I haven't had that opportunity yet, but I've read a lot about it is um, horta, which is like bringing all these wild greens in and chopping them up and cooking them with olive oil and some other herbs. And that that is just part of the diet of knowing what are these, our local greens that we can bring in. And then we just get so much diversity of those phytonutrients that um, we may not even know that we're missing. Okay, so that's our three cornered leek. Let's see who's next. Oh yeah, sheep sorrel. So here's um, another one. So oh, yeah, we've got the sorrel. So this is, a, this is interesting. So sheep sorrel, boy, this can be kind of a, obnoxious weed in the garden, right? I mean, plants, I don't, you know, plants aren't bad. They can be weedy when they're not in the right place. Um, and this is one that definitely will spread and is low growing. Um, and it has, you know, it actually is called sheep sorrel because these leaves, which are about two inches long, um, well, at least this part of the leaf has this little ears and this is like a sheep's head. So, you know, use your imagination. <laughs> and you can see a sheep there. Um, and it is low growing, this particular one, Rumex um, acetacella, but it's related to the French sorrel, like the garden sorrel. So it has that lemony acidic um, tang to it. And um, these are really nice to add in because like our dandelion is gonna be bitter and then our three-cornered leek has a little garlicky and the radish has a little spice and the plantain is neutral, fairly neutral, maybe a little bitter. And this adds just that nice acid brightness. Um, you don't need to eat a whole plateful. I wouldn't recommend that. They are pretty rich in oxalic acid, but so is chard and other things, but they do add that nice brightness. Um, and you're probably weeding them out of your garden anyway. So you can nibble while you're weeding or, you know, set some aside and use it in a, in a garden or a soup or that type of a thing. Um, so this term sorrel, we also see it applied to these that look almost like clovers, right? Which they're not a clover either. Um, and these are oxalis. A lot of what we call sorrels, like the redwood sorrel is an oxalis and the, um, what's the other one? That one that's called sour grass, which has a bright yellow flower that's actually starting to bloom now and also has this clover-like leaf, but a totally different flower than a clover. And so you'll see that terms, this is where common names can be helpful in that it's connecting through flavor is really what's happening here. But these, this, these sorrels are not related to these sorrels at all. They're a totally different plant family, but they all can be eaten and they're rich in oxalic acid and giving that twang. Um, so yeah, even in the redwoods, when you go and you see that um, it has a little pink flower, the redwood soil, you can taste that as well. And it has a real like sour um, bite to it, but it's refreshing, very refreshing. Um, so that's how I've used sheep sorrel is really just a, a side 
a um, little bit here and there to add a nice um, brightness. And then we have some other stars, literally chickweed, Stellaria media, and Stellaria means little star. When you look at the flower, you've got this little star flower. And these are really winter annuals. Um, you know, they go sometimes, actually I did have a nice little patch of chickweed this summer in the shade or the late fall, but in general, it is a winter annual for us. Um, so chickweed is a non-native, but it is um, really yummy and tasty, mild flavored when it's young like this. And we'll get into how to identify. It's got these little leaves that are maybe an inch, half an inch to an inch, and they're opposite from one another. Um, and before it flowers, I'll tell you how to identify it. But it's something like these, you can add bits and pieces to a salad. And then of course, miner's lettuce, right? Um, which we all know, but I don't know, sorry, this is a little out of focus, but when miner's lettuce starts out, it's full, this plant has like so much character with its shapes. So the first leaves on miner's lettuce are these strap shaped leaves when it first sprouts and then it sends up, you know, almost triangular leaves and they get more triangular and then they get round and perforated, look like, you know, the stems poking through, but at first it's, it's strap shaped, then triangular and then round. And you can eat it the whole, you know, all of it. Of course, as it goes into flowering, it gets tougher. And I highly recommend letting some of it flower and gathering those seeds and spreading them. I have, I have just tons of miner's lettuce and I really love it. And it's spreading in, out, you know, in my neighborhood. And, and I wanna do that. You get that, that's, a, that's a, one of our native plants winter annuals and very mild tasting. This can be a base for a, practically a base for a salad. Um, so if you don't have any, find some and you can dig up a clump, same with the chickweed of dirt and bring it to your yard and get it going and then let it go to seed so it can take off. And of course they call it miner's lettuce because it, um, the miners ate it, but um, it also helped with scurvy. Um, so really it's nutritive as well. Let's look at how to identify chickweed because there are some lookalikes. So when it's blooming, it has these little white flowers, but before that it has, chickweed's really fun. It has a little single row of hair on the stem. So you hold it up to the light and you'll just see hairs on one side of the stem. And then it has those opposite leaves. And you can just like, I go out with my scissors and trim the patch and then put that in my smoothie or salad or soup, that type of a thing. Um, that I'm doing. And here's some other things. So here's chickweed up close again. Sometimes it can get a little reddish stem, but you can see just a line of hairs on one side of the stem. And the other thing is when you pull the stem apart, it has a little elastic cord in chickweed. We're going to see that with another, another plant or lichen actually. But there's also the scarlet pimpernel, which can grow with it. And you can see that has opposite leaves. It has a very angled stem and there's no hairs on it. While this isn't poisonous in that it's going to kill you or anything, it's not tasty. Um, and so uh, it's very pretty, but you don't want to be harvesting this and putting it in your salad. And then the mouse ears, which is closely related, um, cerastium, it's hairy all around and it's usually a little more dense. So that's how you're looking for that uh, single line of hairs. And the other thing with chickweed is that it's used also for inflammation of the skin. Um, it can be used as a wash for skin inflammation. So can um, the plantain. Um, and it's used internally, um, like helps with the lymphatic system a little bit. We're going to talk about something else that's really good for that. And then mallows. So we have uh, two mallows, the Malva neglecta and Malva parviflorum. And these are starting, these are coming up. And these leaves, so mallow family is very mucilaginous and it has these rounded leaves. And these are, they're not flowering yet, but they're pretty distinctive leaves. And this is like the Brassicaceae family, the uh, mustard family, it's a very safe family. So when you start to recognize it, you'll know, it's like you can taste it. And they all, almost all of them have uh, what's called a mucilaginous quality like chia or okra. So you chew on that leaf and it's like, gets a little slimy in your mouth, but it's soothing. Mucil mucilage is good because it coats and soothes our mucous membrane. So like when we're having the fire, you know, hopefully we're not gonna have those this year, but if, you're, if you have a dry situation, you have a dry cough or you feel dry, 
you know, things like licorice tea, but you can use marshmallow. It's really great for soothing those mucous membranes. And then you can also, these leaves, especially right now are totally edible. They do end up getting a little rust on them, um, which doesn't hurt us. But if the big leaf has it, you can go into these smaller leaves. And I just, again, cut them up, put them in smoothie, chop them up in a saute, that type of a thing. They can also be uh, made into a tea. And of course it has a white root. So marshmallow is a related plant um, where people originally made marshmallows from and it was a way to get like, have you ever wondered like who came up with the idea of a marshmallow? Like <laughs> doesn't quite make sense until you know where it came from, which was this white root that was mucilaginous and they would mix it up and add sweetener and it would be soothing but they so they used to be made out of marshmallows um and um yeah you can even dig if you're digging these up you can wash them off and chop this up and use it for tea the leaves though are very uh, have a nice mucilaginous quality and also they're called cheese weeds and these little green seeds um, when they're green like this you can eat those and you can also pickle those so it's too early for that but that's something that you can look forward to later on okay and then we've got gallium cleavers so we have some native quite a few native species in california but this is the non-native we want to leave our native galliums alone they're not as big um, these of course goose grass you've probably you've if you don't know this plant, you may know it by its seeds because they really stick on you. And if you have dogs or cats and you have it in your yard, you, you may not have been a fan of this. So, but you can use it. This is another annual and I'm always amazed because it can sprawl um, feet, like many feet sometimes. But when you pull it out, there's hardly any roots. Like it is, it's just got such a life force to it. So it's really easy to identify. It's got many leaves around um, the stem and it sticks to you. So when you pull it and you know, you just like a corsage, it just immediately sticks to you. Um, but the aerial parts, because it doesn't have much root. So they're harvested when it's like this stage and this stage, try and get it before it's like on, before it's going to seed. And um, it's an amazing um, support for the lymphatic system. So for swollen lymph glands um, and also mild diuretics. So you can chop it and then, um, one way to preserve it is to, because it's very fibrous, so you can cut a bunch of it. Um, and then one way is to chop it up into some pieces, put it in a blender with a little bit of water and blend it. So you can kind of juice it that way and strain it and then freeze that juice. Um, in the past I have used, I don't have a juicer right now, but you can mix it with like carrot juice. If you do juicing, you can put it in there. It's pretty fibrous. It's not, I don't particularly like, making things out of it to eat, but I, um, some people do use it for pesto and that type of a thing. So you can play around with it and see what you think. It does, you can see the texture is, is a little tough, um, but you could blanch it or, you know, mix it with other things. Um, it's also made into a tincture, so that alcohol extract, um, which you can read about how to do. And it also can be used as a wash to soothe rashes and skin inflammations externally. But cleavers is really amazing. It's, it's something that's added to as a tincture or that juice that's frozen. If you, you know, feel like you're getting a cold and have those slightly swollen glands, it really helps support the lymphatic system to do its job. Um, and traditionally it was also, because it sticks together so much, um, used as a filter for like milkmaids who are, you know, have milk and just, you know, you get a little bits and pieces of plant material or things in there and you could strain it, like make an instant um, sieve type of a thing. And I've also heard, though I've never done this, that um, you can make vegetable rennet out of it. So if you're um, working with cheese, um, to make cheese, you need a type of rennet. And um, apparently you can make that out of cleavers. And then we have nettle. Um, so stinging nettles, are, this is a little later in the spring, but they are popping up. I have a little nettle patch. So if you want to grow nettles in your yard, you definitely want to choose a place that people aren't going to be walking by. And I finally figured out where to do that in my yard. This is um, something that I found the name, the Kishai Pomo name, um, Ohom, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't speak Kishai Pomo, um, but it means fire. Um, which makes sense because the stings are like fire, right? Um, so here's a plant that, you know, hails all around the temperate parts of the world. 
this is an incredibly nutritious and important plant. And um, you want to get the leaves when they're young before it's going to flower. Um, and it can be cut a few times. Um, and it's easy. I actually collected seed around, we'll talk about the seed, and then um, was uh, what's called garbling them, kind of sorting them out. And some fell in my garden. And now I have these nettles that popped up. Um, and they are starting to sprout now. And so in another week or so, I can start harvesting some fresh nettles. And like, this is a super, I mean, I don't really like that term superfood, but it is a very nutritiously dense food. Um, it has a tough stalk, which actually that fiber in the stalk is used for fiber. And I'll show you a few pictures, um, but it's really, the leaves are high in vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, potassium, iron, and also protein. Um, and um, so very densely nutritious. It's like a, a very dense spinach if you've never eaten it, but you do see it in recipes, you know, people like making nettle pesto or net, um, which I'll show you a picture um, or ravioli with nettle in it. So you can use it, you know, all of these actually, you can make a nettle spanakopita, you could, um, and you could use these other plants in there as well. So anything that's, you know, in quiches or frittatas, that type of a thing, you see a lot of recipes with eggs and cream and nettle soups, especially from the UK. Um, and I probably, the main thing that I like to do with it is to make a nettle based pesto. Some people call that nesto. Um, and I'll show you a recipe. And then a friend of mine, a colleague, um, David Hoffman, who's from the UK, he talks, when in doubt, use nettles. And it is, it's so nutritive. Um, it can be a little drying over time, but that's one of the ways it's used for allergies as well. So it can be used fresh or dry as a nutritious tea, um, great for seasonal allergies. It is a mild diuretic and also a kidney tonic. And especially the seeds have a kidney tonic property to them. And I'll show you what those look like. Um, you're kind of not going to miss what nettles looks like. It has these opposite leaves and you go to touch it and you get a sting. And that um, uh, actually that sting has been traditionally used and was used by the Kishaya, is used by the Kishaya Pomo for like rheumatism. And you see that use in Europe as well because it's bringing blood flow. So I don't recommend, I mean, if you want to experiment and if you have a achy joint, um, as long as you're not a person that like has real reactive skin, if you do, you could get quite a reaction from nettles, but most people just, you get this tingliness that stays for a while. So here, this was a class we did a few years ago um, and we're, we're taking the, the leaves off of the stems um, and then blanching them to make the, um, to be able to cook, to, to use them. I've tried um, making, using raw nettles. I personally don't like it. I like it a little bit blanched. And um, actually here's the fiber from nettle. Um, and there's a whole, if you're into fibers, it's from the dried stock. You can go on Facebook. There's a beautiful um, uh, group there, but this is a traditional fiber that's, um, uh, yeah, that people are getting back into. And then this is what the stinging hairs look like. They look like little glass needles and it actually has histamine, formic acid, serotonin, and it just stimulates it. It's that, um, the blood flow into the area. And these are the seeds which um, hang down and they look, they're like poppy seed size, but these are a really important kidney tonic. And um, I harvest these seeds. And then I also add those like into smoothies um, or if I'm making crackers or something like that, you know, and they just, they don't have much flavor. They just have a little bit of crunch, but then they're giving you that little extra um, kidney support. And here's um, a recipe for pesto. You know, really this is just one recipe, but just to give you the idea, this has whole hemp seeds in it, but you, you know, pine nuts, walnuts, whatever your nut is, um, fresh nettles that you blanch. So you get hot water, put them in for just a minute or two to cook them lightly. I just find the flavor is better um, when I've blanched them. And then cheese, I've also done it with tofu. You know, there's lots of recipes out there for pesto. So you basically just substitute nettle um, sea salt, garlic, olive oil. What I have found is they're, um, they're drier in nature, um, than basil. So I find I usually need to add more oil. So I, you know, if you need a basic recipe, here you go, you can find them online, or if you just like to do it, you know, um, by sight and taste, you'll notice it's just going to need more oil because of just the nature of the, 
the um, nettles. Um, and then you can freeze this. You can make a whole batch in the, in the spring and then put it in ice cube trays and freeze it. Um, and those little, those little packets of ice cube tray size, put those in a, a Ziploc bag and then you can pull them out and add those to, you know, as pesto heated up or on bread or all that kind of stuff. It's a great way to eat nettles. But you can get real creative. There are so many recipes out there for nettles. So here's somebody who made nettle tortillas. Here's a nettle crepe. So the Wondersmith at the very end, I'll give you some websites. So the Wondersmith, she goes over the top, but it's really inspirational. I mean, look at those. It's just so beautiful, those crepes. Um, so um, really you can just think about like, oh, anything that you have spinach in or whatever, you could substitute nettle for. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just really fun to see what people are coming up with. And then this is pickling nettles. I've done this where we've heated up the um, vinegar, just like you were making like a dill pickle or a sweet and sour pickle, some onions, the turmeric and all of that, getting that heated garlic and then putting some nettles in, just blanching them, pulling those out, putting them in a jar and then pouring the sauce over and um, or the pickling juice. And it's just, you know, the minerals, so many minerals come into that pickling juice. So you wanna use that, but it's a nice way if you like pickles and that flavor to, to um, work with nettles that way as well. Okay, I wanna keep rolling because we've got about seven minutes. Um, and so milk thistle, here's one, it's also non-native. You might never have thought of eating this because it's very prickly but they are coming up and they're an annual. They're considered a noxious weed in California, but you know, again, they're not bad plants. We've created great habitat for them. So um, you can, if you have them in your yard, you can weed out the little ones and eat them, which is great. So the young leaves um, can be eaten fresh or cooked um, after the spines are removed, but I have used just these young ones um, with the spines in a smoothie because it gets all broken up. So that's great. And um, when I've done the bigger leaves and you trim off these spines and then cook it, it does taste like a spinach um, as well, or kind of that dense green. It also lends itself because it's got some thickness to it. When once these leaves are trimmed, um, you can do that, that massaging, the kale massaging technique where you use a little bit of citrus or a little bit of lemon or salt and a little bit of olive oil and then just massage it a little and it softens it. It can be really tasty that way as well. It could be part of the pesto. Um, and what's interesting is um, the seeds, you probably have seen it in the supplement aisle, milk thistle seeds are incredible for the liver. They've actually been shown to help regenerate um, liver cells to help our body be able to do that and to protect the hepatocytes. In fact, this, there's a seed, there's a pharmaceutical made from the seed in Europe that's used for um, like mushroom poisoning. And there's actually somebody, a doctor here in the US that has permission to use it for that. And um, because it protects the liver, it's an IV form of it. So this is really an amazing plant. And there's actually a quote from the 1400s I found where um, he was uh, saying, you know, as the world doth decay, so does the use of these virtuous plants like milk thistle, the, the leaves for a pot herb. So he was already lamenting like people not eating the good food. Um, so this is one, it has very, it's also called Mary's thistle, but very much a white milky um, splotch on the stem. And they can get quite large. I, they, you see them in cow pastures and stuff. I wouldn't harvest them there. They do like extra nitrogen, but once you have some, you'll, they'll pop up and you'll need to weed them out, but um, they're, they're easy to weed out when they're, when they're young. Um, but a really um, yummy herb. Um, and this is, so here's our milk thistle. The flowering head is much spinier. And then this is one you might confuse it with, which is our Italian thistle, which you can see it has some white, well, it's not white, actually light green and dark green where this is white and dark green. This you can eat as well. It's just that the leaves don't get as big and they're more prickly. So I've never actually taken the time to trim the thorns, the spines off of the leaf, though I have eaten the stem by peeling it. And you can see the flower head is very um, much smaller, but, um, the leaves too have a little bit of liver support to them. Not the same as the seed, um, but something to incorporate into your, into your diet. 
And then, oh, we're not here yet to Dugford, but I want to show you because I don't know when I'm going to talk to you all again. So in a month or so, we'll start seeing the Doug Furs send out their fresh um, tips. And these are really tasty. And of course, you're never going to strip them all off of one plant, but we have no shortage of Douglas fir in our county. But they're very tasty when they're young. They're very sour and kind of citrusy, and they make a beautiful infused honey. So I fill a jar, I gather these, you know, going from plant to plant, taking a few off of each tree. And then I chop them up put them in a jar. This is actually showing lavender honey, but it's the same process. And then um, pour honey over it. And that, that fur, piney, you know, conifer quality goes in. It is a really, if you use honey, it's a really delicious honey. And it's a nice honey too. You can use it, you know, because anything, the conifers really help with our lungs and that, that just has a beautiful taste to it. And so you let it sit and it will float to the top. It's fine. And then you strain it out and you have this, um, Doug fir tip infused honey. And that's a fun way to work with plants as well. And then I know we're not to rose time yet, but you can also do the same thing with roses. And especially I've done it with the Cecil Bruner, those little roses to make a rose infused honey. So something you can look forward to in the spring when these start popping. And again, gather, just pop up those roses. It's so pro prolific. Break off the petals, put them in the jar, cover them with honey. And they can sit for a long time. Like I have some sitting that's been sitting for a year because the honey's preservative. But you'll, then you'll get a very floral honey out of it, which is a nice, it's a nice little gift actually. Okay, we do, oh yeah, I wanna take a few minutes. We don't wanna forget turkey tails. So turkey tails, this is our most prolific polypore mushroom. This is a very easy mushroom to identify. It's called a polypore because look at the bottom. It looks, it's all these little tiny holes like a very fine tuned sponge, very fine sponge. So you can, um, you can actually make paper out of it. But the main thing people know about turkey tails because it's a little tough. It's not one you're gonna saute, but it's a really important medicinal mushroom and it contains these compounds, these poly, um, polysaccharides. So there's PSP and PSK. And there's been quite a bit of research and they actually, it does support the immune system. And in, in Japan, they actually pull out the PSK and use it as a specific adjuvant cancer treatment. So, and you can buy it as a supplement, but it's so prolific here. So it looks like a turkey's tail on the top and it has white pores on the bottom. And this is the fruit of the mushroom. So you're not hurting it by harvesting some and you wanna get them now. This is their season when they look like this and they're not getting green and algae on them. You harvest them and then you bring them home and dry them. And you might need to freeze them after you dry them or even when they're fresh because the little bugs like to get in there. But once you um, get them dry and they can just be in a dehydrator or out in a basket or in a, um, by the wood stove. Then you put them in a jar so the little bugs don't get there. And then you can use them, you know, put one or two in a soup stock or bone broth. You can dry them, you can powder them and add them to smoothies that way. Um, people do tincture them as well, but this is really common. And here is what they can look like on a log. You always, there's there's a couple lookalikes. They're not poisonous, the lookalikes. They're always growing on wood. Um, they're often on oaks and hardwoods, but they can also be on conifers sometimes. This one has a little interesting color, so they can vary in color, um, but very banded color. And here's some of the lookalikes. So false turkey tails can grow right next to it and it's more orangey, but still has the banding. And then underneath it's smooth and that orangey burnt orange sienna color. So there's no pores. So really easy to identify. They can grow right next to one another. So you just turn them over and make sure you have turkey tails. And again, you're not gonna hurt yourself. These aren't poisonous mushrooms, the false turkey tails. There's also another one that's purple. I don't see this as much, but it does have the pores, but it has a purple tinge. Again, not poisonous, but um, and it's usually on conifers, um, and uh, but it's not turkey tails. And then there's the gilled one, which is closely related, looks like a turkey tail on top, but has gills on the bottom. So really easy to identify. You're looking for these turkey tail on the colors on the top and white pores on the bottom on wood. And um, you're set to go. Like I have some, they'll grow on wine barrels and that type of a thing. They'll grow, you know, they're growing on dead wood. And then last but not least, and then I know we're going to stop, is usnea. 
So this is a lichen that's very common. We have a number of species. So we have long ones that hang down. We also see these ones that look like they have mouths on them. We have a number of species. Usnea is a lichen, and this is a great time to harvest usnea because it's dropping from the um, storms. And so as it gets on the ground, it's not going to live very long. So after these storms, you can be walking around and you'll see usnea on the ground, then you can harvest it. But it's a really important antimicrobial, um, and it's even been shown in studies to be it, it, to inhibit gram-positive bacteria, which includes staph, strep, and tuberculosis, which is pretty potent. Um, and so you'll see it traditionally used topically and also made into um, an alcohol extract. It's also used for lung support um, and topically for irritation. So you can use it as a wash. So you could put your plantain and your usnea and make a tea a strong and use it as a wash if you've got a cut or a scrape. And it also um, dyes wool yellow and some other colors too. Um, it has an inner elastic cord. You see that, especially now when it's wet. So it's, there's another one that can hang down a lot. So these can be called old man's beard. That's a general term, but there's one that's called um, lace lichen and it's very netted and lacy. This doesn't have this. It has, it's either this, you know, shorter one, but it always has these little fibrils coming off of it, these threads, and then it has the main, main um, stem, you could say, and you try and pull it apart and it definitely has an elastic cord. So that's how you tell usnea. And there's many species around the world and they all contain usneic acid, which is thought to be the main active constituent. And there's a few resources. And um, so I'll just talk about a couple. Hank Shaw is local. Um, you can get on his email list. And he also is a hunter. Gather Victoria is like the Wondersmith, very beautiful, elaborate food for inspiration. Um, Eat the Weeds is on the East Coast, Florida, but there's he's got great information. And then you can check out the rest. And we'll go there. See field of dandelions. You either see a hundred weeds or a thousand wishes or dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And thank you too to the over 200 people who who uh, took part. And before oh we get oh before we get to questions, I just want to make a couple of quick pitches. Um, please please uh, go to our website and sign up for our social media. If you don't already follow us, we'd love to have you uh, join there where we post about really great topics like this. And um, look for this presentation and all of the other ones that we've done at our sonomalandtrust.org slash nature at home page. That's where you can find um, all of our educational materials. And please keep an eye out for future webinars. Our next one is coming up on February 24th. It's with James Edward Mills, and he's going to be talking about his, his uh, presenting on his book, Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a ton of great questions, so I'll, I'm just going to jump right in. Okay, great. Okay, uh, starting out by first saying uh, a, just a comment, really, that I am... Um, Chumash and Esalen, and thank you for acknowledging the homelands at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, first question, does the nutritional content of dandelion leaves go down significantly when drying them for tea or powders? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, it's gonna go down some. I haven't seen an actual study, but um, if you dry them well, so, you know, using lower heat, if you have a dehydrator or even like, you know, a lot of us might have a wood stove or a mm -hmm. oven we can have on low, it's really drying it so it still looks like the plant. And that's true with any of the herbs, um, you know, so that it still has that taste and air aroma. If it has an aroma, dandelion doesn't really have that so much. So yeah, you're gonna lose a little bit, but then you have, if you're drying it yourself, you're gonna get like the most premium um, quality. Nice. That you could get. Um, is Plantiago erecta also edible? Oh, it should be. Yeah, I've never tasted it. Um, and I'm thinking that's a smaller one. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I think all the, I have never heard anything about the plantains not being uh, the other Plantagos. Not planting the banana like <laughs> fruit, obviously. Yeah. Right. 
Um, okay, a couple of questions about washing uh, protocols. Oh, if okay. you're wa washing the forage plant thoroughly, is it still a problem if they're harvested from an area where there's lots of dogs that pass through? Oh, I would be, yeah, I probably wouldn't do that. I just yeah. don't think it's a good idea to harvest because there could be, you know, other, there could be diseases that would be spread mm. if there's dogs. Yeah, so it's best to find an area or, you know, in that case, it's like, maybe you can dig some up and plant it, you know, and get it growing in a pot or away from that type of area. Um, That's yeah, a good idea. Like, like on your yard, like, right, if you have an area where the dogs like to hang out a lot. Yeah, I probably I wouldn't be harvesting right there. Maybe yeah. you can create a little area for yourself. Um, okay, can you lacto ferment the radish pods? Oh, you know, you could, pro that's a really good question because it is a brassica. I haven't seen, I haven't done that and I haven't seen anybody do it, but you might be able to. And, you know, what I would do is, um, you know, have that cabbage base that you know mm -hmm. is going to work. And then you can play around with adding things in and seeing what the right proportion, but since it's a brassica, it might do really well, um, you know, you might be able to get to a half and half ratio. I don't know, but I would look it up and I bet it would be great. And you know, you know, who'd be really good to um, check out Pascal Badar um, mm. because he's so into fermenting um, that he's, he may have done something with radishes and you can go to his Facebook page and search, um, you know, and put in wild radish and see what he's been doing. He does that with mushrooms and yeah, he's, that's one of his things. Perfect. Um, do the flowers of wild garlic and scallions look like the three cornered leeks flowers? Um, you know, I don't know of a wild scallion here. So that hmm. may be what, you know, there's a, our common name. So the thing with alliums is because we have native onions, we have native alliums, and they're all edible. If you pick it and it's got that strong garlic um, onion smell, it's okay. And I've seen like there's beautiful ones in the Sierra and there's some really tiny ones too around here. Of course, you wouldn't dig that up, but you could taste a little bit of the leaf, but you, we all know what that smell and taste is. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, there's nothing else that I know of that has that, that's, that's a concern. It's making me hungry right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. I've had no luck growing my own miner's lettuce. Any tips or advice? Oh, interesting. Um, it might depend on the soil that you have. Um, it may be, yeah, I would see, depending on where you are, to find something within your neighborhood, possibly, or that kind of um, soil type. Mm -hmm. and you know something that's close by and then if you can dig it up or collect seed if it's not appropriate to you know if there's not abundance to dig it up but let watch it and they have these beautiful shiny black seeds mm -hmm. so um yeah and you know um larner seeds down in um bolinas i you know look on her website see if she has any tips but usually once it gets established i mean i'm in sandy soil the sandy loam in sebastopol and it's doing great so I don't know. I don't know if it will do great in clay. You know, if you have a clay soil, that might be a concern. Okay. Um, what is the mallow texture? Oh yeah, um, it's uh, it's got it's a little rough. Um, it's got some texture to it. It's not like chickweed or miner's lettuce where it's like really delicate, like a lettuce. So. Um, mm -hmm. Like kale more, I guess it would be, you know, something, but it does have that mucilaginous quality. So it's good to taste it, but that can be really great, especially if you're like, oh, I got a little sore throat or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, so more closer to a, a kale with some, or a chart, you know, there's, there's substance to it. Great. Um, okay, is gallium, the cleavers, same as bed straw? Yeah, so that's one of its common names is bed straw. And then there is um, another gallium that's softer that is was probably the true bed straw um, because this one is so <laughs> sticky. But you uh -huh. could imagine actually filling a mattress with this one too um, in that way because it is sticks together and creates some volume. So um, yeah. Um, 
how do you harvest the nettles without getting stung and eating it doesn't affect you? Does it have okay, to Okay, that's great. I didn't mention that. Once you cook nettles or break it up, the sting goes away. So okay. those sharp um, glass needles that I showed you, they will break. So that when you brush it is when they like poke your skin and do that. So I wear gloves if I'm harvesting a lot of nettles. Um, some people say, oh, you just got to grab it. It's like, you're going to get stung because you're, you're brushing in there. I don't mind getting stung, you know, some, but yeah, just wear some gloves and um, you get, you'll get stung a little bit, but that's okay. Or maybe yeah. not your gloves, you know, and have long sleeves on. Yeah. Or have loppers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and cut it. Yeah. And, you know, you cut it, you really want those tender, like the very tender tips of the nettles. Um, you don't need to take off the stem, but you'll get a sense of like, just working with it, even with gloves on of like, Ooh, it's really stiff there. Um, mm. But yeah, once you blanch it, the sting goes away. And when you dry them, the sting goes away. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, our nettles, another nettle one, our nettles helpful in prevention of kidney stones. You know, I haven't heard that, but um, yeah, I don't know. Um, they're more of a kidney tonic in the sense of like lower kidney, like if your kidney function is not great. I mean, of course, if you if you have a serious condition, you want to be seeing somebody, but they, it's definitely like how dandelion is so great for the liver and supporting that function that the nettle seed in particular is really great for that. And the other thing I didn't mention is nettle root, which is really a rhizome is used for prostate health. So oh. you see that used with saw palmetto for um, um, prostate issues. Hmm. So you can see this theme around the urinary tract in both men, you know, and everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, can't wait till you cover dog bane ah. um, and desert chaparral as a tea for cancer in Native Americans. Yeah, dog bane I do for, you know, as a fiber plant and then chaparral is really, yeah, that is a desert plant, very also known as creosote bush. So yeah, that's a whole other ecosystem that we can't grow that here. Um, right, very potent plant and some people have been using it um, for cancer. I mean, and I'm not going to, you know, I'll just do a little caveat. Of course, if you, again, you want to be working with somebody because there's with herbs, we're going to fine tune and find out what's going on with that person. Um, and there's great practitioners in our area. So let's leave it at that. But don't, don't face it alone. <laughs> get yeah, some, get some yeah. help for sure. Um, can you please show the list of resources again? Oh yeah. Let me go back to that. That's yeah, a great that's idea. Cool. Let's see if I can go back, whoops, there we go. Awesome. Yeah, so these are some websites I found that have some great recipes and, and, seem, and different, different styles um, to these. So you'll find something. I am seeing one, I'm just noticing because I've got the Q&A about Douglas fir honey, is it fresh yeah. or dried? Yeah, it's fresh. So when you're infusing honeys, you usually want to use fresh plant because what honey's a humectant, it'll actually pull that moisture out. So your honey will get a little thinner, but it's as it's pulling out the water in the plant, it's pulling out the flavors that are in there as well. Um, yeah, and you just have to keep kind of turning it over. And then when I um, strain it, um, you know, sometimes honey thickens up or crystallizes, you can warm it up a little bit and then just strain it. Um, but yeah, I think you'll really, it's really a fun thing to do. Um, let's see. Ch help me out with the pronunciation, but um, cheristum benefits oh. or not? Oh yes, yeah, cerastium. Yeah, um, I haven't, I've never used it um, in that way. So it, you know, probably does. I just haven't used it. Um, yeah, it's so, the one that I've seen, it's so hairy that it's just like, doesn't even, like, I don't want to eat it because it's <laughs> texture pull, puts me off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, this person says a little off topic, but curious if you have any advice for living with poison oak. Um, well, learn, you know, one of the big things is learn to how to identify it in the winter, because I think a lot of people brush up against it, even the little sticks, and it is a coyote yeah. plant in that sense of it can be a vine, it can be a little, I think the little tiny 
stalks coming up in the winter, you can easily miss them and get poison oak. But um, speaking of that, so let's see, mugwort. Some people make like manzanita rinses and mugwort washes, um, salt water, going to the ocean and dipping in, um, uh, yellow dock leaves. Some people talk about that. Um, that's actually good for nettle sting. That's what I'm thinking of. But yeah, something that's going to dry it. Actually, I will tell you a tip that Rosemary Gladstar, one of my first teachers, um, so there used to be a company that made French green toothpaste. So it was clay, green clay with peppermint. And it was in a tube and it was very clean. And she was like, this is perfect because the clay, you can get clay and mix it up, put it on your poison oak and it helped to dry it out. And then just like a drop of peppermint oil to cool it off. So Ooh. she loved that. But yeah, I know you got to find your favorite remedy. Um, <laughs> so those are, those are thoughts. Great. Um, this was when you were talking about the dandelion. Can you please put up that great infographic with the nutritional values of the dandelion again? Oh yeah, let me all, I'm gonna do a little um, review here. So as I'm doing that, yeah, that was a fun one. I just found that, that today. One. I had um, never seen that. Yeah, and I think there, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, there's our plantain. Right, here's our, there we go. There it is. Yeah, pretty fun. So, okay, and also what I didn't mention is this is a cup of chopped leaves. So, you know, that's oh. a lot. Are you really gonna eat a whole cup? But you can see even just including it if you had a half a cup or something like that, or if you did a big, you know, saute or stir fry type of a thing, you could certainly put a, quite a bit of dandelion in there. Um. Let's see, we had another request for another slide too. It was, could we look at the dandelion, what it looks like with the bumpy leaves? Oh yeah, and that one, uh, let's see. That's where in the dandelion. Yeah, that here. one's yeah. right here. So this is the bumpy one. This is called bristly ox tongue. And mm -hmm. um, they're all related actually. They all have those yellow um, composite flowers. Um, but this one, it's like you touch it and it's like very bristly. Um, it's like, I mean, you probably could eat it, but I wouldn't just because of the texture. It's yeah. going to be very bitter. Here's one. How much um, oxalic acid is too much for your kidneys? You know, that's a great question. So in that book, um, I'm going to go back the one by John Callis or Callis, mm -hmm. however you want to the edible wild plants. He actually he is so awesome because he really gets into this one. Um, he goes right detail and he's got a whole section on there on oxalic acid and how too much there's been we've made way too much of a big deal about it for most people. Some people are very sensitive to it. And if you are or if you've had um, calcium oxalate kidney stones, then you want to be more cautious. But there's oxalates in a lot of foods um, that we commonly eat, like chards and that type of a thing. So um, yeah, I'm not going to be eating handfuls of sheep sorrel, but having a little bit in there is no shouldn't is not going to be a problem for most folks. Great. Okay, here's an idea. Radish pod plus uh, daikon equals kimchi? Question mark. Oh, potential. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the idea. I think the radish pods and the kimchi or the sauerkraut, that type of a thing is a really good idea. What's the second one? The daikon? It's a daikon radish. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. It's a specific type of radish. Are all California alliums edible? Yeah, I've heard all the alliums. I mean, some are really spicy. Like I've only, I've tasted some in the Sierra that are quite tall where they're, you know, the little tiny ones you're just taking a nibble, but there are yeah. a few species where you could harvest some leaves and they've like, whew, they pack a punch, which is great. Mm -hmm. If you like that, I, I like that flavor. Um, let's see, okay. Da, 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 da. Do you recommend washing all plants before eating them or is it safe, like you said, to kind of nibble as you go? You know, I think you just have to assess that, like it just rained. So if you were out somewhere and it's like, oh, it just rained, there's not dogs right here or what, you know, you can tell, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna eat that. And actually, right, eating 
we want to support our microbiome. And so if it's too clean, you know, we want it to be safe, but mm. it's okay to get, you know, a little soil on there and all of that. That's, that's for the most part, usually really good for us. So, yeah. yeah. And what I'll do, you know, if it's just rain and I'm just cutting things in my garden, I'm usually not washing them unless um, it looks like, or I'm just doing a quick rinse type of a thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, can plantain be used in a sitz bath for women after childbirth? Oh, definitely. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, because it's healing tissue. Mm -hmm. um, please repeat the benefit of the Doug fir honey. Oh, it's more of just a culinary delight. Um, oh, but I did say, Beautiful. so conifer needles, so you can think of pines, right? Like just smelling pines, our lungs, like... Oh, I just breathe better. Um, and it's from those essential oils in there that actually help mm. open up the lungs. So there's um, a little bit of that in the Doug fir and you get that kind of conifer flavor. So it does have a little bit of essential oil that's giving us that, that flavor and it does have an affinity to the lungs and just helps open the lungs. Um, so it's something that you can put into tea. It's really nice. Um, you could also do it with cocktails, you know, just to bring in that yeah. kind of flavor. Yeah, yeah good idea. Okay. You can play with it. Um, can the purslane be transplanted easily? Purslane? Yeah. Yeah, that's a summer um, one. So I didn't include it. It's kind of a succulent that will show up in your garden. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was small enough, I don't see why not. I haven't trans, well, I've transplanted it a little bit, but um, you can also buy seeds sometimes for, because it's grown. Um, uh, uh, if you go to a, like a Latino store, they have it, the greens Verdelagos, um, so mm. smart to like be eating. And those also have a mucilaginous quality and a little bit of that um, sour quality to them. So yeah, um, so you can buy seeds for purslane where it gets taller and then the one you usually see in your garden is a little more lower growing and succulent. They're all succulent kind of leaves. Um, yeah, it should, when they're young, they should be able to be transplanted. Nice. Um, can you infuse eucea? Is that how you use it? Oh, usnea. Uh -huh. Usnea, thanks. In oil, or is alcohol the only medium that you can use? That's a great question. You know, I've never worked with it as an oil. Um, so I'm not sure it'd be worth a try. What I would, if I was going to do it in an oil, there's a way, Michael Moore, who's a great herbalist, he's since passed on, but he, he, um, would do this technique where um, he'd take things that were resinous, herbs that were resinous, even like calendula, and like spritz them with a little bit of alcohol. So uh, before he put the oil on, and that helped the alcohol helped pull the constituents into the oil. So if I was doing that with usnea, I would definitely do it that way. It needs a pretty, it needs the highest strength alcohol. Like you need to buy Everclear to get the best um, alcohol extraction from it. Okay. Yeah. It's not, um, yeah, and you can get, yeah, the tea, um, right. It's mostly alcohol soluble. You'll get some things out of water, but mostly alcohol. Okay, thank you. Um, I've heard a bit about eating basil uh, rosette from the dandelion. How does that work? Is it specific? Is it, should you do that during a specific time in its growth? Yeah, it's so interesting because I just read, um, there's an herbalist, um, Guido Masse, and he grew up, he's, he's got relatives in Italy and grew up partially there. And he was just reading about dandelion and how that tradition of going out before they're flowering and basically cutting off the rosette um, from the root. And it probably sprouts back because dandelions are amazing that way. Um, so I haven't done it that way, but you could, you know, if you've got enough dandelions, you can just cut off the tops, the whole tops, and then cut, you know, chop them up and, and cook them that way. And it will grow back. Probably. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see what else. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of thank yous on here for the wonderful presentation. And a question about where can somebody go to take a class? And learn more. Oh yeah, so um, I mostly teach at the California School of Herbal Studies. Um, I then you go to our website. Um, I don't have any classes, one day classes up there right now, but I will have some. Um, okay. And of course, we're in that transition with 
Zoom or on site and when we'll be able to do more of that. Um, I'm going to be doing a class with Pepperwood Preserve um, in June on St. John's Wort. So we're going to have small groups, safe, COVID safe small groups, but go out and actually harvest St. John's Wort, which is of course considered an invasive weed, but it's an incredible medicinal. So we'll make an infused oil out of that and probably some tincture as well. Um, so that, that class is definitely set. I think it's June 12th. Um, okay. Yeah. Super, super. Um, another one about poison oak. Are there any natives that can compete um, out of poison oak? Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe, you know what probably does is blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> i mean we've got native blackberries i mean black yeah so good question though <laughs> pick your pick your plant i guess yeah here i think yeah oh my gosh here i'm gonna go back to the uh, resources okay great thank you sure um let's see elder i think this might be one of our last ones but elderberry flower usage for fevers and the use of berries to use in syrup or, or flu for flu, sorry. Yes. Not really a question, but can you speak a little more about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so elderberry, um, we have our native elderberry and there's also the European one. So we have the blue elderberry um, and yes, the flower. So when I learned about elderberry, when I was first studying, um, people were taught, we, we were not emphasizing the berries. So it's been fascinating to see that shift. It was all about the flower. Um, so the flowers can definitely be used. They're traditional um, tea for um, fever mixed with equal parts of peppermint and yarrow flowers um, and really to help. So they help with fever and help you sweat it out and all of that. Um, and then the berries, you know, are going to have more um, antioxidant. And also there's more studies, more recent studies on some of the elderberries to help with um, viral replication and that type of a thing. So yeah, both of them. Here's the thing, when, when you're harvesting flowers, you certainly never wanna harvest all of them if you wanna get fruit later on. So um, you, you, you do some flowers and then let the rest of them go, go to fruit in the fall. And um, pretty easy to grow. You can buy them at our native plant nurseries like Cal Flora, uh, California um, Flora in, in um, Fulton. It's an excellent uh, nursery, love them. So you can get your own just as long as you have the space to grow it. Um, and I would recommend growing elderberry because it's become so popular mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot more people are harvesting in the wild and that, you know, like mm -hmm. I really encourage like as much as possible to grow and encourage or to attend the wild um, as much as you can. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Autumn. This was amazing. I learned a ton. I'm sure everybody did. and. Thank you for just sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom with us. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's such an honor to um, work with Sonoma Land Trust, um, near and dear to my heart and um, all the amazing work that you do. And yeah, I'm hopefully we will see each other out in the field. Yes. This in, year. This year in 2021. <laughs> That's right. And um, everyone be safe and, and add some more greens and, um, uh, wild foods into your diet. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Good advice. Good advice. Thank you, everybody. Take yeah. care. Be safe. Thank, thank you. Good night. Good night.